personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hi, I'm Dave Trillo, and this is the Resistance Library Podcast. I'm here with Sam Jacobs, so I gotta ask, Sam, should we start this one off with a trigger warning? Ha! <laughs> I think that all of these come with a trigger warning, and that is to uh, keep your finger off one until it's actually time to fire. Keep your, uh, your booger hook off the bang-bang switch, as they say. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, today is going to be, we're going to talk about trigger warnings today. Um, it's going to fit into the broader thing of, you know, what some have called safetyism. But I always say, I mean, we touched on this on the 9-11 episode as well. But I always say that, you know, you can get any law in America passed if you just say, well, if we don't do this, a kid might get hurt. And then, oh, whoa, oh, wait. Oh, Got to pass a law. Um, people often use the phrase, we live in a bubble-wrapped world. Uh, I think that, well, I think that's mostly a Western thing, first of all. Um, I think that, you know, in, like, Armenia and Georgia, they're probably way less concerned about their kid falling out of a tree and breaking his arm than we are in the United States. But, you know, just say a kid might get hurt and you will get your law passed. Um, I don't think that anybody is opposed to reasonable efforts to make the world a safer place, but I think that the operative word here is reasonable. So let's take, you know, God, this is going to date me, isn't it? Lawn darts. Does anybody remember lawn darts? That's a horrible example, probably, because it's like you have to be at least 35 to remember lawn darts so i'm people, just a little too young i had the crap kind with the blunt noses that would skitter across oh, the lawn man i had a friend who had the cool ones and it was the last day of school we were all playing it and i threw one and it came so close to hitting his mom's minivan and his mom hated me anyway so i was just like in mortal terror as that thing came down from the ground but in any event lawn darts for people who don't know are like just picture a giant dart and you throw it into the air and it comes down and you're supposed to hit a target on the ground. They were, they were banned. I mean, I don't know that they were banned, but they were pulled from the market anyway because a kid got hurt or killed playing with them. Yeah. And it was one father whose campaign got lawn darts, you know, completely taken off the market. Um, how about just, you know, not letting your kids play with heavy pointy objects while you're not watching them. It's a little too much to ask from people. I have, and I think that a lot of this stuff is about that. Is like, well, why don't you just like parent your child? <laughs> As if I have a conspiracy that lawn darts were were banned because of the uh, the lawn aeration lobby, the people who will punch deep holes into your lawn for its well being. They wanted to get rid of their competition one way or another. I like it. I like it. It's not as good as the uh, current. Well, this is a total digression, but I don't care. It's cool. It's getting mentioned on the on the podcast. the The current my current favorite conspiracy theory is that the man who appears at Democratic Party campaign rallies and who appeared at the Democratic National Convention is not actually Hunter Biden. That they've like hired an actor to play the role of Hunter Biden on the campaign trail um go down that rabbit hole sometimes kids because even if you don't end up believing it it's a lot of fun but in any event um this you know there was legislation but there's it's more than legislation because there's this entire culture of like safety which has been expanded beyond even physical safety to emotional safety which is where this whole like you know, trigger warning and safe spaces thing comes from. And the, and the common like response that like, man, you want to talk about dating yourself as a certain age. If you think that this is a thing that only 
exists on college campuses, um, you are probably collecting social security because <laughs> this is not like this weirdo thing that only exists on college campuses now. So why are Americans so obsessed with safety and what is the end game of all of this? And I think that most importantly, the question we should be asking ourselves is what can we do to reclaim the previous culture of self-reliance, mental toughness, and giving people the benefit of the doubt? Not assuming that when somebody, assuming that somebody just misspoke, uh, not that they, you know, are expressing some deep-seated uh, race hate that they, you know, have been keeping concealed from the public for their entire adult lives. That you know, the mask slips kind of thing. Um, President Dwight D. Eisenhower talked about bankrupting, bankrupting ourselves in the vain search for absolute security, and I think that that phrase is worth taking into mind as we go down this alleyway. Uh, there were two books published in 2018 that offer parallel insights into the problems presented by say, the safety obsession in American culture. There's a book, book uh, by William Eggington called The Splintering of the American Mind and oh God, I can't say that name. George Lukianoff, I hope I got your name right because you've actually read this article and think that it's good. Uh, and Jonathan Haidt, which I believe is how that's pronounced, uh, they wrote a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. The, the first one, The Splintering, is more about Americans tunneling themselves off into these, like, bubbles, you know, where, like, um, I mean, the QAnon thing, like, I don't mean to pick on them, uh, and it's certainly not what I'm trying to do, but, like, I think it's a really good example of, you know, people tunneling themselves off into a specific view of the world that doesn't allow for any, um, uh, doesn't allow for a lot of conflicting information to get in. Um, I also think that the sort of like radical liberal BLM view of the world is, is, is that as well. Uh, I don't think that the two things have much in common other than that. And then the coddling of the American mind is about the tendency that Americans increasingly have to avoid any uncomfortable or unpleasant information. There's another concept that we should talk about very briefly. Australian psychologist Nick Haskam coined the term concept creep. Um, trauma is a good example of that. So trauma used to mean something, right? Like trauma meant that like your mom locked you in a broom closet and made you eat your poop every day for a month or I was stepped on a landmine and I got my legs blown off or something um, trauma now means really any kind of even uh, physical or emotional discomfort let alone harm and then of course there's the increasing belief among the left uh, on the you know those on the fringes of what I would call radical liberalism who think that words can be violence. And I think that it's worth noting that they don't just say that words can be violent, which I think that there's some truth to. Um, I don't want to go too far in that direction, but sure, there's some truth to the notion that, you know, words can be violent, um, but words are not violence. So to be sure, you don't think anyone ever got post-traumatic stress disorder from Twitter? No. No, absolutely no, absolutely not. Um, or, or for that matter, from like being bullied in school in ways that are fairly conventional and within the norms of regular bullying and hazing. Uh, no, I just don't think that things that everyone in human history went through without complaining too, too much about them after their 16th birthday are causing any kind of trauma. Hero is another one that's been expanded. You know, like uh, one of the times I first noticed this was when uh, when uh, George W. Bush began referring to everyone who died on 9-11 as a hero. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're not a hero because you were in a building and a plane smacked into it while you were in it. 
<laughs> you know, your, your death is certainly tragic, but like, you're not a hero. Uh, nor is every firefighter, teacher, podcast co-host. Yeah. Nurse, Safeway cashier. Um, I hate the phrase frontline workers. It's like first responders was kind of like bad enough for me. Oh yeah. No, but, I, I love the guy in the produce section of death, but he ain't no Superman. Right. Nor is like a, nor is like a cop who works a tough beat in a, in a, you know, in Chicago. Right. I which mean, isn't to like say that what he does isn't difficult, dangerous, that he's not doing things on a daily basis that I would have a great deal of difficulty doing, that he doesn't deserve a certain amount of respect for putting himself out there and taking on a job that other people don't have. But, you know, like coal miners exist too. And they're not heroes because they go down in a coal mine. It's just called doing your job. Yeah, I mean, another example that comes to mind, the nurses. We, we love nurses here uh, at ammo.com in the resistance library. But, man, did they ever get sanctified by the whole pandemic thing. Yeah, and I mean, I think that the, the first major expansion of it was 9-11. But the pandemic just brought it to absolute absurdity. Like, yeah, the cashier at CVS is not a hero because he showed up for work. You know, <laughs> sorry, cashier at CVS. Yes. Um, I have a great deal of respect for honest work, and I do not mean to make light of anybody who works for a living, but doing so does not in and of itself make you a hero. Now, like a lot of things, there's not really, there's never really any like retrenchment of these words once their definitions become expanded. Um, trauma just means everything now and violence will soon mean lawful, peaceful speech that somebody disapproves of. And there's not a lot of going back in the other direction on that. Um, the other kind of flip side of the coin, which we'll talk about a bit more later is that if me saying, you know, no, no words to you, is violence then what is it if i stab you are these the same thing are they in the same ballpark you know i think that all of that is worth uh contemplating when we expand these definitions to the point of absurdity the original meaning of them becomes more and more watered down you know so like if the safeway cashier is a hero What's Audie Murphy? What's Edward Snowden? What is an actual hero who does actually heroic things? Um, I think that that is very much possibly the bigger uh, danger of expanding these definitions. So the coddling of the American mind talks about other concepts that we talk about when we talk about the American obsession with safety. Uh, I think that this is like I keep calling it American, but I think it's an Anglo thing. Uh, I think it's a Western thing in general, but I think it's mostly an Anglo thing. I mean, in England, God, are they obsessed with safety? Everything is like, oh, it's got to be, everything's got to be safe. And, uh, yeah, you've seen uh, the pictures of the police's knife sweeps with spoons and bicycle oh, spokes in them. God. And, and rulers. Um, you can't buy more than a single packet of aspirin at a time in the UK. Can you even overdose on, I think you can get sick. You, you can't overdose on aspirin. Um, and it is an extremely unpleasant way to die. Your your organs basically liquefy over the course of about a week or two. I mean, it takes a long time. But once you get enough aspirin in you, like, there's no fixing it. Huh. But, you know, I don't really think that it's, especially in the age of the Internet, I, I, I doubt that many people are even attempting to overdose on aspirin as their preferred method of suicide. And also, you know, there's all the lockdowns in the UK and the curfew and the way the lockdown's been enforced in Australia, you know, Canada, New Zealand. Yeah, I think that it's a very, very Anglo thing, uh, Western in general, but Anglo in particular. And so the coddling of the American mind talks about how th there's this obsession with safety. But when you combine this obsession with safety with this splintering that sends people's minds entirely down these tunnels that 
become the only thing that they're capable of seeing. Opposing sides and different views of the world are, are seen as dangerous and they have to be discredited at all costs. Uh, I do not think that this is a both sides thing. I think that the left is a million times more guilty of this than the right is. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't really hear a lot of people on the right or in the center talking about how ideas in and of themselves are dangerous in the same way that the left kind of has this view of, you know, thought crime. And there's this weird moral panic going on right now about blackface. So you have to remove episodes of the golden girls where they're wearing a mud mask and like, you know, this kind of uh, stuff, which I think was in some ways the hallmark of a certain aspect of the right in the, in the 80s, I think is pretty well the domain of the left in the 21st century. There's also the aspect of it where people, I, I, I think for a variety of reasons, do not have the critical thinking skills that they did 50 or 100 years ago. So... You know, labeling people racist, white supremacist, whatever, phobic, um, and this is, you know, considered more important and more powerful than reasoned arguments are in the 21st century. So that, I think, is really important to note, uh, that we've reached a point where the quote that we use that is supposed to be from Voltaire, but I'm Voltaire is like Mark Twain. I'm always like, I don't know if he said that. Mm. Um, Somebody did anyway. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And I think that in my, albeit limited reading of history, that the sort of dehumanization of your enemy and the painting of your ideological opponent as somehow dangerous simply for thinking thoughts and writing words uh, or, or simply by existing for that matter is the precursor to atrocity. Um, I do not believe for a second that the, we are that far removed from the far left in this country talking about liquidating middle America in the way that the Soviets liquidated the Kulaks in the 1930s uh, and the, you know, the genocide that occurred against Ukrainians in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Uh, I'm not saying it's around the corner. What I'm saying is that the preconditions for it are being created and strengthened and reified today. This is not, again, confined to political radicalism or academia. Uh, any of it, but in, in particular, the safety obsession finds quite a home in corporate America and the ideological kind of safety um, is sees expression in the concept of woke capital where corporations kind of find the, you know, the, the moral outrage of, of the day and use it as a marketing strategy. Remember when every Fortune 500 company was posting black squares and talking about their support for Black Lives Matter and amplifying black voices, and, you know, ending white supremacy in the United States? Yeah, that's um, always been J.P. Morgan's uh, main goal. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Education from kindergarten to university is increasingly about teaching doctrines and ideology, primarily incredibly left-wing ones. Um, If you don't believe me, you should find a way to pick up the National Education Association monthly magazine. Your local library may or may not have it. Um, My mother is in the teachers union and it like, this was way before uh, the religious fervor around George Floyd started, but Every article is about like how do we use our teaching positions to dismantle white supremacy and these the, you know these kinds of things. Um, this is very very dangerous because we now have two generations that are completely steeped 
in this kind of ideology. And it, what annoys me the most about it is like, they think that this is, you know, like if they, they think that, that like the Tulsa race riots are some deep, dark secret that no one wants you to know about. It's like, this is like every, like, like everyone who knows anything about American history knows about the Tulsa race riots, knows about the Klan, knows about, you know, race riots in general in America and things, and things like this. I mean, this is not like this hidden esoteric knowledge that only you, Mr. Mr. College educated man have access to, um, trigger warnings and safe spaces. So for those who don't know, a trigger warning, uh, is an advisory that disturbing content is going to be posted. This is another great example of concept creep because now like, you know, there'll be trigger warnings for just about anything that would offend somebody on the left of the political spectrum. Of course, like the way that they always frame it as well, it's, it's not because I'm a leftist. It's because I'm a decent person and you're just an piece of garbage who lacks empathy. Empathy is another word that they got um, concept creep on. And God, do I hate the word empathy whenever deployed for political purposes. It's because Safe you're some kind of monster, it, Sam. Well, I, yeah, no, clearly, clearly I'm some kind of monster um, for a variety of reasons. Safe space is a similar concept. Uh, this used to mean like, you know what a safe space used to be? A battered women's shelter. That used to be a safe space. Your husband's beating you. Come to the battered women's shelter. It's a safe space for you. That's what that used to mean. I now it means, I never liked the phrase battered woman. I just got to say it. Okay. Because those alone, either of those things is very good. When I see the word battered, I assume I'm about to eat something <laughs> delicious. And woman right. requires no further elaboration. But put together, it's the worst. And it always seemed just a poor, a poor choice of phrasing. But... That's a little outside the scope of what we're talking about. Yeah, so a safe space now means anywhere where, you know, there can't be any room for disagreement with the prevailing orthodoxies of, you know, 21st century feminism or um, critical race theory or gender ideology. Um, I refuse to use the word gender to describe male or female. It's sex. Yeah. Gender is a whole uh, new ugly theologism. Gender is, is like some nonsense that's made up to deconstruct the concept of biological sex. And yes, I'm aware that there are like outliers, bio, genetically genetic outliers in the uh, in the binary of biological sex. So I'm not going to say, well, there's only two because I am I am aware that medically speaking that that is not actually true. Yeah. Uh, however, there are not you know, 6,000 of them, uh, there's a discrete amount and they are determined by genetics. Um, so I will not use the word gender, uh, when I'm referring to biological sex, all of this probably sounds really silly. And I certainly think that there's the case you made that it is, but what's not silly about it is that, uh, first of all, it's like everyone in academia has to put up with this. And academia is like barely the right word for it because it's just this like indoctrination center slash daycare center for 21 year olds now. That's what higher education is. But it's if we could keep it there, it would kind of like it would be dangerous, but it wouldn't be as big of an issue. But it's all over the corporate world and all over the media. I mean, I remember like, you know, 15 years ago having to sit through a sexual harassment seminar and that was like kind of bad enough. But now it's like diversity uh, seminars and racial sensitivity training and all these kinds of things. You know, th this is why it's like, like, tell me it's not a big deal when you have to uh, engage in some weird speech code and tap dance to keep your job after you after your company rolls out its critical race theory uh, diversity training seminar, which thank God the president has said, not only is the federal government not allowed to do it, but if you have a government contract, you're not allowed to push any of this garbage on people. You know, it's not surprising that this is the corporate elites are pushing this because most of them come from the Ivy league. Here's a really good one from the Ivy league. The Har Harvard law, not too long ago was urged not to teach 
rape law <laughs> or even use the word violate, which like, I don't know how you would talk about violations of the law without that word. But the argument by the professor was that it created anxiety um, among students to even have to discuss these topics, which made it difficult for the professors to teach their students. You know, it's going to be a lot of very poorly prepared advocates for rape victims in the future is the kind of unintended consequence of that. You know, there's student groups where uh, students are urged to not participate in class discussions that talk about sexual violence. Student groups will warn students in advance so they can skip class or even exclude the triggering material from their tests. Um, again, I think that like that there's kind of a general victimization of society with this, but like if you're, you know, how are you going to prosecute a rapist? How are you going to defend a man falsely accused of rape in the courts uh, if, if no one has ever d discussed any of this and no one is able to kind of sit through the, you know, process of doing it? Uh, Laura Kipnis, who is a professor at Northwestern University, she was hauled into the kangaroo court, known as a Title IX court, over an article she wrote for the Chronicle of Higher Education, which was about campus sex panics, which are a very real thing. I don't know where people get the idea that, like, college campuses are this, you know, nonstop drug-fueled orgy. I think that college students are probably getting laid a lot less than they used to and are only kind of, like, performatively talking about things like, in giant air quotes here, sex work and, like, cam you know, cam girls and stuff like escorts. And like, I don't think that there's, I think that these poor kids are so de-sexed that it's, it's like, why even bother going to college anymore? Sex work is another one of those words that only just got yeah. recently thrust into the lexicon. It used to be prostitution, but now you will not see it referred to as anything but sex work. Yeah. And it's also like, that one's interesting because, um, these girls, it's mostly girls and by the way, they ain't making any money. You know, I know that there's this like perception that, oh, these girls are making like $20,000 a month. Some are, yeah, very Ka few. They're the 1%. Like almost none. Mia Khalifa made $20,000 total. And she was like the most searched porn star on the internet uh, five years ago or whenever she was big. I, I honestly have no idea. Um, but you know, I, I mostly have seen what she did when she kind of did her, like speaking to her about her, her experience, uh, in the, in the pornographic film industry. And she was like, yeah, I made 20 grand total. <laughs> so there's these very isolated cases, but for the most part, you know, none of these people are making any money, but what's interesting to me is how they like, they use this term sex work that like, you know, pretties it up and makes it look look nice and like throws them into the same, you know, bucket of people as like women who are being trafficked and, and, and women who have, um, drug addictions and, 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 and men for that matter, uh, who have drug addictions and have not a lot of other options, but to sell their bodies on the streets. I mean, this is like, I have like weird points of agreement with radical feminists and I pretty much think that – this is a weird, like, confession, but, like, I love Andrea Dworkin. But I, I, I think that, like, the, the radical feminist uh, analysis of prostitution is basically right on the money and that it's there's nothing, like, cool or glamorous about it at all. There's nothing feminist about it at all. Um, that it's just this, like, horrible form of quasi-slavery – that people are subjected to and that the government should crack down hard on Johns and pimps and like basically just leave the women alone except to offer them resources to get the hell out of it. I, this is like one of the things I hate most about libertarians um, is they're like that they, that they've kind of joined in this chorus that like, you know, prostitution is cool and glamorous and sexy and 
but this, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is we're getting far afield. Yeah. But like, I just, you've reminded I, me I of totally, uh, you remember George I, Carlin. It, all, remember George Carlin. That, George Carlin. He says, "I don't know why prostitution is illegal. Selling is legal. Fucking is legal." I do know that bit from him. Now that he's saying it. Uh, but in any event, like the the, 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 the atmosphere on college campuses is, is, is I, I you know, not having been on one in God only knows how long, uh, I think much more in the direction of people being like shit scared to to have sex because of this absolute panic about, you know, everything is rape and all, all of this kind of nonsense. Camille Paglia, who I also like a lot, a lot, um, talks about this topic. It's college kids are not screwing anymore chris rock won't perform on college campuses anymore he's he he's not alone um college campuses used to be where comedians would that was where you made your money you know unless you were jay leno and you got and you had your vegas gig going on or you know you were like a top you know make movies or something but it used to be a great place to make a lot of money because college campuses have these huge endowments and they can hand out big checks to comedians to come entertain the kids and um you know people won't do them anymore because somebody's going to get offended and go crying and you know there's going to be protesters and yada 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 microaggressions i love these that i try and microaggress wherever possible um, examples of microaggressions, which are, I don't even know how to define this is like, cause there's no, there is no definition of it. It's just like anything that the powers that be in our bizarre, uh, human resources department, police state that we now all live under decide is a microaggression is now a microaggression. I don't see race. Uh, America is the land of opportunity. I believe the most qualified person should get the job. These are all microaggressions. You know what you did. <laughs> My God. You so, know, I have a uh, girlfriend who's, who's visibly not white. People ask her all the time where she's from. And uh, it never occurred to her, never occurred to her to get offended by this. She was surprised that people were up in arms about questions like that. Had to be explained to her. And I get why people amazing. like get tired of answering the same question all the time. You know what I mean? Like, like that part of it, I understand. I, I, I understand the like constantly being asked the same question. Just like, oh God, you know, like they're from New Jersey. Yeah, that's like um, when people ask me what's wrong with me. <laughs> when people ask me what's wrong with me, I'm just like I have I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to begin answering that question. But yeah, I mean that's like I think a good like a good example of it because I think that like people with sort of more refined social skills know that there's it's it's like a slightly inappropriate question to ask unless you know somebody really well. Mm -hmm. um, but like there's nothing like like no one means anything hateful by it. No, it's interesting. They're just curious and trying to relate and trying to talk to you and like it can be awkward, but so what? So what? If you remember the '90s, you remember political correctness. Um, I have not watched the film PCU in probably 20 years, but I remember thinking it was funny as hell when I watched it in the '90s. Uh, and early 2000s, especially when I went to school, because I went to uh, I went to university at a at a very like lefty activist school, is that, and I was is you know that the like one with the stoners who were trying to go to a George Clinton concert. Yes. Okay, I remember that one. Yeah, it's really funny. It's got David Spade in it. Uh, it's got uh, what's his name? The guy directed uh, Iron Man. John Favreau's in it. It's, I, I remember it being really funny and I, and I almost like don't want to watch it again because I'm afraid that it will, it will ruin it for me. But maybe I'll, maybe I'll go watch it when we get off the call. I don't have a, I don't really have much else going on today. <laughs> so I think that, that to be rem reminded of political correctness, if you're a Gen Xer or older or, you know, an older millennial who kind of can remember this, I think that there's, there's some truth to, to the fact that this is just kind of warmed over political correctness, but it's totally not the same thing when you consider the degree of it. I mean, first of all, political correctness was like about 
eliminating kind of like vestigal hate speech. I hate that term, but I'm just going to use it. Um, so like, you know, little people don't want to be called midgets and they're not asking you to come up with some bizarre term, you know, like that makes them not abnormally small. Right. Um, they just don't like being called midget and it's like, okay, well, you know, fair enough. Billy Barty, who was an actor who was like hated being called a midget. Fair enough. This term is offensive to you. Um, I don't really know why little person works. Sure. Mentally disabled instead of retarded was another one that was like rolled out, uh, around that time is like, no, you're not supposed to call people retarded anymore. You're supposed to call them mentally disabled. Okay. Fair enough. It also political correctness. People forget this aspect of it. Um, it was about kind of broadening the canon of literature to include more women and minorities. Um, I think that that aspect of that is also in play today and what they call like decolonizing literature. But I, before it was like, you know, why don't we read some Emily Dickinson alongside Mark Twain? Now it's like, you know, some woman you've never heard of who wrote a book 10 minutes ago, this has got to be included alongside, you know, Ulysses. <laughs> um, and I think that like another difference is that in the nineties during political correctness, there was also, and I don't think the political correctness was a good thing, but I think that a lot of it was just, um, a lot, not a lot of it, but I think that there were aspects of it, which were simply about kind of, um, appeals to the Anglo-Saxon sense of fair play that kind of permeates our culture. Like I was saying about the midget versus little person thing. It's like, okay, well, fair, fair enough. You know, this is what you prefer to be called. It's not like now where we're asked to deny basic reality in, in, in this, in this way that we, you know, we have to jump through hoops for mentally disturbed people to like deny basic reality, which I think is, is very much the hallmark of the current kind of resurgence, uh, of what was political correctness in the, in the, in the nineties. Um, the other thing too, is that it, you know, there's this giant assumption that college students are super fragile and can't take any kind of discomfort, which I think is, it's basically true. Um, it's fine. Not that I spend a lot of time around them, but I can imagine that, uh, you know, I remember when I was in college, I mentioned that my friend had a Maine Coon cat and somebody was like Ooh. really disturbed by the fact that there was a cat called a Maine Coon cat. And I was just like, why? And it's like, I know I knew why, but it was just like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever been uh, harangued for. Uh, while in college and believe me i got harangued for a lot of dumb stuff ah it's so funny i've got the same kind of story a girl ah. a girl thought i was uh i was uh indictable for owning a german shepherd what I'm not kidding well because she said, wasn't that place. a nazi dog i could tell she had two brain cells and they weren't really positioned close to one another but it was amazing that she was able to make that connection She's just say, me and my dog don't talk politics. I said, you leave my dog Hitler out of this. <laughs> so if you were born before 1985 or so, your childhood was very, very different uh, than uh, people born afterwards. I can't, you know, it's like this whole, I drank from the fire hose and one came as I please, yada, yada, yada. Rode your bike without a helmet. You got bullied at school. It's like, well, it's kind of good for me. You know, I learned how to toughen up and thicken my skin and uh, tapering off around my age. But, you know, I remember my parents going, a kid hit you on the school bus, whack him, and whack him back. Mm. You know, there was no need for like a meeting with the principal or anything. It's just like, just punch the kid back. And I don't, you know, whatever. I mean, I don't mean to speak for everyone who was bullied in school because I wasn't, I don't think I was really bullied that badly, especially once I stopped giving a shit, I was a lot less fun to bully. I, I certainly count myself among people who v views being bullied in school as a character building experience. I don't feel traumatized by it at all. Uh, so how did all of this change? Well, 
uh, missing child milk cartons are a strange genesis of it, but a good place to begin because there's like, there were three really big child abductions around that time. Eaton Platts, Adam Walsh, Johnny Gosh. Um, there were many, many more, but there was a company in Des Moines, Iowa, who started putting the pictures of Johnny Gosh and Eugene Martin on milk cartons. Chicago was next, then the entire state of California. Uh, and in December 1984, there was a nationwide program launched to keep the faces of abducted children in people's minds by putting them on milk cartons. What's weird is I always saw this on TV as a kid, but I don't ever remember there being milk with missing kids on it when I was a kid. So apparently this did not get to uh, suburban New England in the 1980s. Yeah, same here. Milk cartons uh, didn't really find any kids, but it did create the, sta- the stranger danger panic. Everybody remembers don't talk to strangers. You know, not bad advice to give to a kid, but most child abduction, child molestation, physical and sexual abuse comes from f- friends, family, uh, school teachers, camp counselors. I, I, even though I'm Catholic, I would be remiss to not mention uh, clergy, Catholic priests being part of that, and of course the most notorious. But big fact, your kid's a lot more likely to get molested by their school teacher than they are a Catholic priest, and you can Google that shit. Uh, Most missing children in America are runaways. 99% of all child abductions, the perpetrator is the non-custodial father. That is, almost every child abduction in the United States is a dad is unhappy with his visitation rights, grabs his kid, and takes off. Um, Which, like, I'm not saying it's good, but this is not what people think of. Um, We have at least one example of stranger danger being harmful. There was a lost 11-year-old Boy Scout who hid from rescuers because he thought that they were trying to kidnap him. Some protocols that were established... Again, this is one of those, like reasonable measures can be taken kinds of things. Um, Amber alerts and code Adam are two things that came out of this. Um, this is like the Amber alert everybody knows about because your phone makes that obnoxious noise now. And it's like, they just blast out. There's an abducted child. They're in this car. Keep your eye out for them. That seems to have worked. That's helpful. Um, code Adam is a thing that is a protocol that came, was come up with by Walmart. It's named after Adam Walsh. I'm not going to get into the details of the Adam Walsh case because it is deeply disturbing, but basically code Adam is you go up to somebody, you know, I can't find my child, uh, in Walmart or wherever. Um, you'll see the signs of Walmart, but it's not exclusive to Walmart. And they say code Adam. And what that means is all the doors get locked no one can leave and, uh, until we find your kid or we call the cops. One of those two things is going to happen. We're either going to find your kid or we're going to spend so long sweeping the place that we know he's not here. So we call the cops. I think they call the cops immediately. I think that they immediately notify the cops or there's like a three minute limit or something. I mean, it actually is like, it actually is like reasonable because is it disruptive to your day if you're in a Walmart and you know, they, they call a code Adam and you have to like stand around Walmart for 20 minutes. The thought of being stuck in Walmart makes me want to dangle from the ceiling. Sure, sure, sure. And like, fair enough. But like, yeah, I mean, you're you're like, your time is not so valuable that you can't like hang out in a Walmart for 20 minutes while they try and locate somebody's missing child so that somebody doesn't walk off with him like they did with, with poor little Adam Walsh. Um, but stranger abduction used to be Like it wasn't like an epidemic, but people are so aware of it now that it's like, it's so, it's so rare. It like never happens anymore. Kids do not, sorry, QAnon listeners, kids do not just get picked up off the street in the United States by strangers. It just doesn't happen. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a black swan. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not a, it's not a common occurrence, but there's a dark side to this. So there's the whole thing where like, there's tons of cases of, uh, parents being arrested because their children are playing alone, uh, without adult supervision somewhere. Parents get questioned in the car or the C- child protective services Gestapo comes out, um, which is I, child protective services is up there with the TSA in, uh, in, in, in government organizations that I absolutely hate. Uh, I don't think they have 
any interest in protecting children. I think it's all about making every parent a potential suspect and weakening the child-parent bond at the expense of the state or at the expense of the parent in favor of the state. Um, there was also the panic after the mass shooting at Columbine High School, which certainly is tragic. Um, I graduated high school the year before this. And I cannot imagine being in a school. I mean, like I've talked to so many guys who are my age or younger or older rather. And we're like, did you not write about like how you wanted to shoot everyone in your school in your, in your like creative writing class? Yeah. And they didn't do anything about it. Cause it was just like, yeah, you're a pissed off little kid. Um, you know, now you bring a butter knife to school and you're looking at expulsion under these zero tolerance policies. The most one, that, the most ridiculous one that pops into my mind is like the six year old kid who chewed his pop tart into the shape of a gun. Yes. Bites, you know, yes, and then I saw that. And then there was another one with a chicken tender. Yeah. And they expelled these kids from school. Like this is, this doesn't keep kids safe. No, it probably worsens those kids' lives to the point where they may become a bigger risk to society. Right. Exactly. Um, there's the school-wide peanut butter bans, which, like, are stupid and I don't think really require any further unpacking than that. Um, so there are, like, there's a generation or two of American children raised in bubble wrap. And not only does that mean that they have trouble expressing themselves, you know, expressing anger, um, expressing negative emotions, because you might get tagged as, you know, a potential school shooter. But it also means that they don't they lack exposure to failure and discomfort. I mean, there's you know, and this again, it's one of these things It's like there's a good faith effort to protect children and increase overall child welfare, but we've actually created a world where children are much less safe and much less able to deal with the problems that, um, you know, they, they may run into. Um, cops, boy, we need to update this because this cops is still on the air as of April 2020. It ain't anymore. Cops is a uh, casualty of the church of George Floyd and has been taken off the air because cops are bad now. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I love the show Cops. God, I love cops. But <laughs> if, you ever wanna, great... if you ever want to look at people that you can feel glad you're not, you just got to watch Cops or uh, maybe go to Walmart. But Cops is a little more convenient. Yeah, I mean, Cops. What can you say about Cops? So there's the Cops in the 24-hour news cycle began around the same time. And cops like you know just brings the worst people in america into your home for saturday night entertainment it was a mainstay in my home every saturday night the old man was watching cops and so i had seen a lot of cops in my life and then there's the 24-hour news cycle which has to you know fill its time with with mostly bad news because like news isn't good for the most part chasing criminals in the act. And so what you have is the steady stream into American living rooms of like, you know, it's a very dangerous world out there. And, and, and you'll hear people talk about it. You know, like I was at a, a barbecue with my family over the, over the summer and somebody's like, well, you know, it's just not safe out there for kids anymore. And I'm like, you're so wrong. It has <laughs> never been safer. It has absolutely never been safer with the exception of like, you got to watch what your kids do online. Uh, you know, that's kind of like the only thing that's different is like, you got to watch what your kids do online. But like, kids are, sorry, again, sorry, QAnon people. Kids are not getting snatched from public parks by strangers. They're getting abducted by their fathers or they're getting diddled by school teachers. And like, that's who you got to watch out for. There's not like a guy lurking in a van who's going to offer your kid candy and take them off. It just doesn't exist, but people think that it does. Um, it's a, there's a generational aspect of it. The older generations tend to conflate millennials and Gen Z, also known as the Zoomers. But there's two key differences. One is cultural, one is clinical. First is that uh, Zoomers are like full digital natives. They have no memory of a world before an internet. They have no memory of a world before smartphones. Um, I remember BBSs. That's how old I am. And they, you know, millennials probably didn't have constant access 
to the internet through either a laptop or a mobile device until they were, you know, in college maybe, but middle school anyway. Yeah. Uh, but Zoomers just had it like forever. And there are, uh, the, what, the, one of the effects that this has had is that, or, or seems to have had, is that the Zoomers are much more prone to mental illness, depression, anxiety, alcoholism, self-harm. Um, depression and anxiety is, is just through the roof for girls. There's moderate increases for boys. Um, self-reported cases are up, but there's also clinical data. Like there's a 62% increase in hospital emissions among, among so the Zoomers. You're not just being diagnosed more. They're actually suffering from these conditions at a higher rate. Yeah. It's, it's not just like the pathologization of every human behavior, which I do think is a thing. Yes. Um, but you know, like like autism is just male behavior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm really I'm really into my interests. You know, like so, so says every man in the world. Um, there's um, there yeah, there, there's hospital admissions to kind of back this up. So it's safer than ever to be a child. But as a, as a consequence of this, you know. There's there's verifiable psychological damage being done to younger generations. You know, I think that the, the coddling that they're getting on on universities is certainly contributing to that and making it worse. Silicon Valley bigwigs won't let their kids like use social media or have screen time for the most part. They know that it's damaging. Doesn't that just say um, it all? Yeah, I mean it's yeah. Social media seems to be implicating girls more than boys. Girls, for whatever reason, seem to be more sensitive to like notion that their their lives suck because they're not um, leading the lives that influencers portray themselves to have on social media. But it's also like that cyberbullying is much harder to track and police than you know the bullying that goes on in the real world. Part of that is because. They, you know, the social media companies like won't cooperate when they need. They probably should be. Kids aren't allowed to play with toy, with toy guns anymore. And we talk about the pop tart thing. Every kid I know played guns growing up. I don't know that you're really allowed to do that anymore. Well, the pop tart um, makes a perfect weapon. You can just eat it when you're done. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like it's the ultimate 3D printed gun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then part of this too is that like there's the division between the blue states and the red states we've talked um, before I think that this is more of a cultural divide than a political divide on the one hand there's urban and suburban college educated Democrats and on the other hand there's ex-urban and rural non-college educated Republicans there's a class element to it as well you know there's some animosity and resentment between these two groups which isn't really uh, especially new in American politics, but it certainly accelerated under George W. Bush and really kicked into overdrive uh, among particularly people my age around uh, the election of Donald John Trump to the United States presidency. You know, nobody wants to even entertain ideas that they that make them uncomfortable anymore. And I think that this is like, Again, more of a left thing than a right thing. I think right wingers uh, or people in the center even are much more amenable to like show me show me this argument that I probably won't agree with because people over a certain age don't generally change their minds very often and mm -hmm. you know yada yada yada. But you know the left in particular does not want to hear anything that it does not want to hear. There's been a string of disinvitations on college campuses. Uh, Richard Spencer is, of course, a highly controversial figure. Milo is less so, uh, but you know, Ann Coulter again is like even less than that. Yeah, but she, Connelly's ben a, Shapiro, famously, yeah, Ben Shapiro is like God. How lame do you have to be to be offended by Ben Shapiro? <laughs> <laughs> and didn't um, didn't Jordan Peterson actually come to prominence because of the PC culture on campuses? Jordan Peterson came to prominence because he said that he would not use, um, he would not obey the pronoun law that they passed in Ontario and that he would be arrested and go on a hunger strike if anybody tried to force him to do it. Um, that's how he came into prominence. 
But Condoleezza Rice was disinvited in 2014 <laughs> from, I forget where, uh, you know, the first black female secretary of state, the first female head of the IMF and the first finance minister of a G8 nation was disinvited. I mean, like, it's not even like, you know, milk toast kind of conservatives like Ben Shapiro. It's like people who are objectively accomplished figures in the world. Like I have, I don't have a lot of affection for Condoleezza Rice, but like I cannot imagine being such a spoiled brat that Condoleezza Rice is going to come to you, come speak to you probably for free because that's usually how I, mean, I saw Oliver North speak on my campus. Well, that's how old I am. I saw <laughs> Oliver North speak when I was in college and like there was a protest outside. Sure. And they were obnoxious, as protesters are. Hmm. But they're certainly within their right to protest Oliver North. And there's a lot of good reasons to do it. But, like, the idea that, you know, where I would say that the line gets drawn is that you think that no one should hear Oliver North speak. You know, so I can't imagine being so spoiled that I go to a school that is prestigious enough to land these kinds of speakers. And I'm going to cry to mommy and daddy about getting them disinvited. I do think that a lot of this to a certain degree is like a, a sign of our cultural decadence. You know, we're so comfortable that we have nothing to do but complain about um, peanut butter and gun-shaped Pop-Tarts and Condoleezza Rice speaking on our campuses, which is probably a good segue to talking about victimhood culture, which I would like argue that we basically ha live in a world where, um, you know, victimhood is, is seen as, as some kind of badge of honor and is somehow enriching you as a person and making you more, um, gr giving greater value to your opinions and things like this. I mean, even when somebody's this is me as innocuous, it's like as a woman, I think, you know, it's like, well, I've been, I, I, I fall here in the progressive stack. Yeah. And so my view carries greater weight than, than that of you, a mere man. It's a total um, ranking system. Right. By which the, the more victimized you are, the, the greater like importance you have. Um, the Nietzschean in me is just like, goes nuts at this because it's like, man, like, Assume that these people are victimized, which I guess, like, I, re I reject the notion that I, do, I just don't believe anyone is oppressed in the West. I just don't buy it. You know, it's just like where, like, anytime any of this, like, systemic racism and they give any kind of quarter to this idea that there's systemic racism in the United States. Like, no, there's, there is not systemic racism in the United States. No one is oppressed in the West. You want to see, like, racial uh, uh, oppression, um, you know, go to India where the caste system basically still exists and, 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 and people are like, you know, at the bottom rung of society that they can't ever get out on because 10,000 years ago, their great grandfather to the nth degree was the guy who had to go uh, pick up the barrels of shit from everybody who lived on a street. Like that's, that's what, that's what oppression looks like. We do not have oppression in the West, but we pretend that we do. And the people who pretend that they do, you know, think that they, they have some kind of, uh, some, some kind of value. Writ. Some... Yeah. Right. It's, it is, the, it is this kind of like, it does have this religious aspect to it. I mean, the earliest cultures in the West are honor cultures. Honor is one of the people, oh, honor is good. Maybe we should go back there. Um, the honor culture is not really good. There's ton. I mean, the littlest the littlest things would result in, in violence. I mean, you read about like what people would duel over in the, in the antebellum South. It's amazing. Um, isn't it? Everything, everything, everything. I wonder was there's like, anyone left. Yeah. It's, it's not like, it's not good. You know, like we have contract loss. So we don't have to have blood feuds. Uh, we actually have advanced as a, as a species, because we don't have to like settle everything in this manner anymore. Um, so this was superseded by what the sociologists have called dignity culture. Um, people are kind of presumed to have an inherent human dignity uh, you, and that you're, that you have, even if people, um, look down on you or even if you are objectively oppressed in some way, you know, you, you still have human dignity and people are admired because they have thick skin. 
You know, if you can just kind of brush off the slings and arrows, people go, wow, cool. I admire, I admire that, man. You think about like the, you know, the kids at the Woolworths counter, um, getting, you know, the black kids at the Woolworths counter getting milkshakes dumped over their heads while they try to do a sit in to integrate the lunch counter. And like, I think that most, you know, morally decent human beings look at that and go, wow, I have a lot of respect for that guy because he's able to kind of like shoulder that without letting it break him. Yeah. Um, and to, to even respond to your enemies is to dignify them. If someone calls me a name, it's so not even worth my time. They're beneath me anyway. It's just uh, you're dignifying assholes by engaging with them. And this whole offense culture, this outrage culture overlooks that extremely useful tactic. Yeah, I mean, I just like it's the whole sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me thing. I mean, obviously, we, you know, everybody knows that this is like a super simplistic way of looking at the world. Like, yeah, words can hurt you. Fair enough. But like words, I, words can't break you. Maybe I'm wrong. Somebody can tell me I'm wrong, but like I think that that's the, that's the difference. So, victimhood culture is like what we talked about earlier. Is people are, you know, divided into these classes where like being oppressed is a good thing, and being a victim is a good thing. And I mean, this whole like uh, a lot of I think a lot of the um, a lot of the gender stuff is like we talked about this. I think off mic. A lot of the radical gender ideology is like allowing avenues for people who have absolutely no claim on being oppressed to mm -hmm. like take up the mantle of being oppressed and get some kind of social clout for it. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just like, I think that marginalization in Western society in the 21st century is largely a individual and social choice. Um, I don't really want to talk much about the litigious lawyer thing because i think that frivolous lawsuits are like i think that it's the, the bigger thing to say about litigation is that like we have too many laws and that's kind of part of this safety culture thing is like we don't need a law for every potential situation um i think that people talk about frivolous lawsuits i think it's mostly a, a straw man and everybody wants to bring up the woman who burned herself at McDonald's and got however much money she got. And like McDonald's was totally in the wrong there. And this woman deserved every penny that she got when you actually read about the, um, yeah. McDonald's and, argued that she was entitled to less money because she was older and therefore her private parts were worth less effectively. The jury didn't go. For yeah. That. There was all kinds of stuff. And like why the judgment was so big was because the judge was so annoyed with McDonald's. Hmm. Like that literally is when you read about the case, the judge was just like, he was a Burger King man could have settled it for 10 grand, but he ain't settling for 10 grand now. So next time think about settling for the, you know, the woman's skin graft instead of, uh, you know, making her chase you in court for, uh, for however long. I mean, frivolous lawsuits are like almost never go to trial, but there is kind of the thing where like disputes that used to get, you know, just kind of taken care of between individuals are now like, you know, we have to have a lawsuit about it. And like, you know, I just, I think that that's just a general part of the, like the bubble wrapping and we got to have a law for every potential situation that comes out um, I think that the Chinese cough um, is a really good example of how safety culture has extremely negative consequences and we way overreacted to it um, I think that you know there was a time when an abundance of caution was appropriate but I do not think that there is any evidence now that any of the extreme reaction to it was necessary or appropriate, um, I think that there actually is a campaign to kind of demonize Sweden because they didn't do any of that and they kind of came out okay on it. But like, God, imagine if there was like a virus that actually was dangerous, you know, to non elderly COPD patients. 
I just don't know how, you know, what kind of overreaction we're going to, we're going to get then. So I want to talk in closing because man, this is a long one. Um, I want to talk in closing about this concept of vindictive protectiveness, which is a term co- coined by hate, hate and looking off. If I'm saying your name wrong, I have never been more sorry for saying somebody's name wrong because this guy was like, Hey, this was, this was he did, I treated this topic very well. Vindictive protectiveness is a term they came up with to describe the atmosphere on college campuses in the United States with regard to speech codes and similar but I think that it can be applied more broadly to the cultural atmosphere in the United States and the West today uh, because there's very much like a pipeline from college campus to corporate boardroom to office to the you know lives of everyday average Americans who now have to watch what they say all the time and maybe even what they think because they're going to fall afoul of these extra legal speech and thought codes and you know the uh garden variety idiot will say oh it's not censorship if the government doesn't do it yeah i mean cool like i'll go eat garbage because i posted the wrong meme on facebook (laughs) um that's you know people's lives are being ruined by this i don't care if it's the government or private companies doing it an entire generation is being raised to see this as not just normal which would be bad enough but beneficial And that means that as this generation who's being raised in this environment grows up and enters leadership positions, um, there's a significant chance that these codes will be enforced much more rigorously, not less. I believe that there's ebbs and flow in this. I mean, there wasn't a lot of political correctness uh, on speech code policing during the administration of George Bush, um, nor for that matter really during most of the, the Obama administration. You know, I think that it kind of like started, the gears started turning in about 2015 or so, um, 2014, 2015, but like not in 2010. I don't remember any of this. It could be wrong. Though, you know, I think it's worth noting that like there was a similar but not identical phenomenon under George W. Bush that was like the stuff we talked about on the 9-11 podcast, which is are you with us or are you with the terrorists? And if you don't want the TSA guy stroking your testicles while you, you know, get ready to board an airplane, <laughs> you must want the terrorists to win. And like, I mean, I remember like the first day of the Iraq war going to work, I worked in a warehouse during the Iraq war. And like the first day that I went into work, it was just like, I did not want to say anything about how I was against the war because it was like, man, y'all are really on like really on board for this. I doubt any of them are anymore, but um, I think that if we look at the way that political correctness was enforced in the 90s and we look at the way the speech codes are being enforced now, we can see that they've been dramatically ratcheted up. Um, and while it, I, I think that, you know, one of my best friends thinks that what's going to happen is one day all of this is going to stop. Like nothing happened. You know, I mean, like a good, a good parallel is uh, satanic panic. Anybody remember satanic panic? This was like the idea that daycare centers were ritualistically torturing children and like candy apples and razor blades because there was Satanists who need children's blood and all this. People really believed this. Uh, People went to prison because of this. McMartin daycare center. Google it. The tunnels under McMartin daycare was a whole thing. And it was so ridiculous and you can't believe that any adult like believed it, but they did. And people went to prison over it. And then one day it was just done. It was over. No one, no one talked about it anymore. It just went away like a, you know, plot on a, on a, um, a soap opera that goes nowhere and they just go, Oh, drop it. I think that, that, that there's an extreme possibility that that will happen that would probably be where i would place my money on the roulette wheel is just one day like what are you talking about what do you mean we pulled episodes of golden girls what do you that that didn't happen (laughs) you know that kind of thing but i think that the next time it comes back it'll be a thousand times worse because it'll be coming back because these you know younger people who have no other frame of reference will be the one enforcing it of course there is there is the very uh strong possibility that 
you know, young people, by which I mostly mean Zoomers who are like, you know, under 18s and under 21 type of people, maybe I don't know, but um, that they just will completely reject it. It's possible. I think that there's probably a good segment of them that will, but there's this very, like, very dangerous respect for authority that has crept into our culture. And by authority, I mean the priests and ministers of correct thought in the United States and the rest of the Western world, the most low ranking of which are public school teachers, um, who I probably shouldn't even get started on what I think about public school teachers, but suffice it to say, I do not have a positive opinion of them. Uh, they are sort of the lowest ranking foot soldiers of disseminating this orthodoxy. But of course, there's also, you know, the people in the media, uh, the people in the think tanks, the people in academia, and the people way high up on the food chain who start these ideas and sort of, you know, disseminate them into um, public consciousness to the point where they just become unquestioned orthodoxies. And I think that that is the real danger. So I think that it's worth sort of briefly talking about, you know, how do we, what do we do about all of this? Uh, we call bullshit. That's really it. And you call it all the time and you call it whenever you see it. And I am, you know, I've, I don't know that anybody wants to live their life anything remotely like I live mine, but I am perhaps a big stick in the mud with my friends because they will send me innocuous memes that disseminate these kinds of, you know, talking points or even like sort of weak tea, Ben Shapiro, own the libs, LMAO, triggered snowflakes type memes. And I will say, actually, you're wrong or actually this is important because this, you know, activity that is being engaged in by triggered snowflake libs is dangerous and you should recognize it as such and not just laugh at it like, oh, tee hee, there goes the purple haired people who don't know uh, which bathroom to use. Ha ha. I identify as an attack helicopter, um, you know, whatever. I think that people really need to sharpen their thinking about this kind of stuff stop viewing it as some kind of joke, stop viewing it as something that can just be laughed off and ignored, especially now. I mean, this piece was written before, um, before the church of George Floyd started changing American culture for the worse. And what kind of America do you want to live in? If you're a parent, what kind of America do you want your children to live in? You still giving money to the NFL? who hate you and hate your values and want to disseminate this propaganda that, you know, there are um, legions of cops hunting black men for sport in this country. You know, I think that it's important to, I don't think that we can fight every little battle and I understand that, but I think that there are battles that are worth fighting. And I think that it is, uh, important both to tell the truth and to rigorously examine uh, lazy aspects of our own thinking in this regard and to do what we can to support businesses that whose values align with our own. You know, I forget which company does which, but there's two energy drink companies and one of them, a handful of executives came and said, we want to do woke branding and they fired all of them. We was Red Bull. You know what I buy when I need an energy drink now? Red Bull. Red Bull is not my favorite energy drink, but like you bet your ass I'm giving my money to the company that hurt. Let's get woke and just fired them. I'm for any company that has cartoons for their TV advertisements. <laughs> God, I remember the first time I had Red Bull too. It was like, crack it tastes um, like you're sucking the wine out of a dusty carpet but i think it tastes like liquefied sweet tarts and that's why i love it man ooh. it is good stuff bang i believe is the company who gives money to the trump campaign 
But it, like, if I'm wrong on that, you know, whatever. But when I need an energy drink, I'm picking up Red Bull or I'm picking up Bang. I am not getting anything else, you know. And it's like, I don't feel that you have to apply it to every aspect of your life. But like, if you can find places to give money to companies whose values align with your own, you should do so. We give ammo.com gives part of its proceeds to, you know, pro freedom, pro second amendment nonprofits. So if you need some ammo, you should buy it from us and are, not, are we the best company to, uh, to spend money on? Do you think we probably are because I mean, without question ammo never goes out of style. So you should go to ammo.com forward slash podcast and pick yourself up $200 worth of ammunition because you will get $20 off. And I know that you guys are trying to get as much ammunition as you can online before Joe Biden gets elected president and makes it impossible. Don't worry, guys. He ain't going to win. But, you know, stock up, lads and lasses listening at home. Um, This is maybe the longest episode of the Resistance Library podcast ever. I hope it's been a good one for you guys. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. I'm Sam Jacobs, and we'll see you next time on the Resistance Library podcast from Ammo.com. Mm-hmm.